Hi, well, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Eric Lev Patton, and um, Leah Prescott, who is uh, my usual uh, co-chair, she may or may not be with us um, today. So um, I know that she is going to be uh, traveling some. Uh, so if she doesn't show up, that's probably why. So um, welcome to the monthly NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group meeting. Uh, it's great to see everybody. And um, I just want to take a, uh, a couple minutes to take a look at uh, the list of attendants. Also, um, we, we've been separating out a little section for new members. Um, so it looks like we have uh, Hannah Wang from uh, the Meta Archive Cooperative, who's new and um, not sure whether or not uh, Nathaniel Smith has joined us. Nathaniel, are you here? Let's see, I don't think so. Okay, um, but while we're there, um, Hannah, would you mind taking a minute to just like introduce yourself really quickly? Sure. Hi, I'm Hannah, um, and I. Uh, this is my first time attending the infrastructure interest group. I think in the past I've I've attended the content interest group and some others, but um, I started as the facilitator from at archive in January, taking over from Matt Schultz. Um, and I've been at Jacopia for a little over a year working on various digital preservation and curation projects, but um, I'm happy to be here. Great. All right. Well, thanks for the intro. Okay, and in terms of housekeeping, um, I don't think we have anything else like uh, we did last time with regard to any surveys or anything. So um, without further ado, I wanted to introduce uh, Andrew Woods and um, he's joining us uh, today from uh, Harvard University. And as we've been, um, as we mentioned uh, during the reminder that I sent out, um, Andrew's going to be leading us in a conversation about uh, OCFL uh, today. And um, before being at Harvard, uh, Andrew was um, previously a longstanding technical lead at Fedora. Um, and uh, yeah, Andrew, I know we've, we've talked before about OCFL and a different group. Um, so it's really great to have you here today to go through this presentation with us. Um, I have a bunch of questions kind of written up from last week, so um, I'll be interested in asking a bunch of those uh, later on. Uh, but thanks for, for sharing out your presentation and um, yeah, welcome. Appreciate the, uh, the time spent. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Eric uh, and everyone. I, I appreciate that and um, uh, look forward here to, uh, to chatting a little bit about OCFL. Uh, so should I go ahead and share my screen and uh, and we take it from there or? Um, yeah, sure. I, I guess uh, I'll just um, encourage folks to, you know, go ahead and add any questions that you might have uh, during Andrew's presentation. Just go ahead and add them to the chat um, or feel free to unmute and jump in and uh, ask away. Um, Andrew, I, I don't know if you want to kind of save questions for the end or just have them anytime or what, what's best for you? Yeah, um, actually, I. I don't mind if we are a bit informal about this and, and making it as conversational as possible. So uh, yeah, if, if there are any questions that, that come up uh, sort of as I'm rambling, um, please stop me and uh, interject uh, right away. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. It's, and, and maybe that speaks a little bit to the question of timing. I've, I've tried to uh, scope this to 20 minutes, uh, something like that for, for um, uh, the presentation itself, um, but so presumably uh, there's an hour or something less than an hour you know, for an OCFL conversation here or 45 minutes or something like that. Uh, not, not for presenting, I'm just sort of you know, encouraging people to feel free to interject um, and, and you know, I'm just trying to get a sense of you know, what, what window of time everything needs to fit into. Yeah, I would, um, I would say, you know, the next 45 minutes, 40, 45 minutes would be fine. Um, you know, if we go through your presentation and then have, you know, 15, 20 minutes worth of Q&A or, you know, however it works out, uh, you know, during the presentation, that'd be great. Okay, perfect. Cool. That, that gives me a good sense. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, unless there's anything else, I, I'll, I'll go ahead and 
get started here. So uh, as Eric mentioned, um, I, I'm, I'm super delighted uh, to be here uh, to talk about OCFL with everyone um, and I'm coming as a representative of the OCFL editorial group. Um, and uh, I think everyone has the slides uh, and there's a link actually here on the first slide uh, if, if you don't. Um, uh, and, and the entire editorial group is listed um, at, at one of the end slides. Um, so we'll get to that later. Um, but from my own perspective, and, and please be thinking about uh, what, what you're bringing here, what, what questions or interests you have, but from my own perspective, um, I, I'm hoping to get out of this session uh, for, for the whole team here, uh, at least establishing some sort of basic understanding of OCFL. Uh, and then that will entail a little bit of, of going into some technical details. So, so just you know, trying to do some level setting on what OCFL is about um, and answering any outstanding questions that you might have. Um, and then maybe more importantly from my perspective is, is taking advantage of this opportunity uh, for us to maybe discuss how uh, in this conversation, we can uh, continue to advance uh, some shared priorities. Um, uh, and so, uh, you, so before I, I go on, you know, so that, that's just kind of what I'm bringing here. Um, are there other uh, interests or objectives that uh, would be useful to raise now from anyone here, uh, just to maybe help contextualize the nature of the presentation or the conversation? Just a question, really. So, uh, so, um, all right. I'll feel free to if if something comes to mind um, in the course of things. Uh, yeah, let it be known, please. Uh, so, in in terms of shared priorities and and shared objectives. Uh, I, I wanted to reflect back on the team, uh, your own, the NDSA's mission, which I think deeply resonates with what we're, what we've been trying to achieve with OCFL. So uh, the NDSA is a consortium of institutions that are committed to the long-term digital preservation or long-term preservation of digital information, which yeah, absolutely, like this, this is exactly uh, a, a strong aspect of what we're trying to do with OCFL. Um, and, and then further on, NDSA's mission is to establish, maintain, and advance the capacity to preserve our nation's digital resources for the benefit of present and future generations. So I, I think we are completely aligned here. Um, and, and, and I guess I, I would like for us to continue to advance the mission by uh, collectively uh, agreeing on uh, and shaping some foundational specifications. Um, and, and once we have those foundational specifications, then we can, on top of that, adopt practices, we can adopt tooling, and so not necessarily adopting software, but, but aligning with specifications that then you know, we can all build our own or, or adopt various applications, but uh, establish communities of practice and tooling uh, for the digital preservation layer of things uh, ultimately, so that we can redirect our energies to higher causes. Uh, uh, for example, you know, once we have the digital preservation layer under control and we agree on, on the principles and we agree on how to uh, realize those principles, then you know, maybe we can, we can redirect some of that energy uh, towards open access or establishing shared collections or interoperating uh, between our systems or you know, new discovery uh, mechanisms, you know, et cetera. But, um, yeah, that, that's that's the direction that I hope we go in in terms of establishing some of these foundations. Um, and and speaking of foundations, uh, the uh, levels of digital preservation, which I suspect you are all very familiar with, um, I, I does a fantastic job of providing a blueprint, a foundational blueprint for what uh, we all want to be doing with digital preservation solutions. It, it provides in my mind, the check boxes uh, that we all want to check uh, for our various solutions. Um, maybe what it uh, leaves less certainty around, and, and I think this is intentional, but it leaves less certainty around is the how. Um, 
and 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 uh, you know, this is this is where OCFL comes in a bit, uh, and and this is just sort of a, a, a draft thing that I did. Um, you know, sort of take it for what it's worth, but I, I wanted to overlay on top of the levels of digital preservation, uh, the overlap with OCFL. So the items that I've highlighted in green are areas where OCFL directly supports uh, these elements of you know, what's being recommended from. Um, <clears throat> the levels of uh, digital preservation. Uh, and then the, the items that I have highlighted in orange, uh, OCFL doesn't necessarily directly su support it, but uh, there are very clear ways that this information uh, can be recorded and persisted uh, inside of OCFL objects. Um, and, and then quite honestly, the items that are uh, neither highlighted in green nor orange uh, seem like they're mostly around documentation or policy uh, or you know, sort of procedures that institutions uh, internally would need to institute. So, um, so I want to throw that out there, uh, which then brings us to OCFL itself. Um, and, and without going into a lot of detail, uh, you know, just wanted to mention that uh, the origins of OCFL started with, uh, it, it sort of came out of, uh, you know, not necessarily intentionally, but there was a group of folks um, at Oxford uh, that was you know, talking about digital repositories. And uh, basically the concern was raised of uh, the abstraction that often exists between me uh, and the content that I'm trying to preserve. I, you know, ultimately, I want to know what's on disk or I want to know what's being persisted. Uh, so that just yeah, you know, so that uh, I have assurance that it is useful and meaningful going forward. You know, sort of you know some of the, the basic uh, tenets and, and objectives uh, from a, a general digital preservation perspective. Um, so the, these conversations uh, continued on and ultimately culminated in a community call that took place in December of 2017, uh, where. Uh, 47 people attended, uh, representing 32 different organizations, and, and the idea of that call was basically trying to surface uh, from the community, you know, what are the successful practices and experiences that, uh, you know, in trying to distill out the commonalities there, uh, ultimately in such a way that they could be represented in a specification. Um, since then, uh, there have been monthly, and there continue to be uh, monthly community calls. There's information, I think, in the last slide, uh, where uh, you know, the, the specification and and the effort around OCFL in general is discussed. Um, and there are also uh, the editors have weekly calls. Um, so, uh, yeah, that that's that's kind of where OCFL came from. Um, and uh, the the logo here, uh, just kind of as a Point of trivia, um, you know, I, I, I sort of think of this, uh, or the name that I hold in my mind for this logo is bursting from the rubble. So uh, the the principle here is that you know if I just had the hard drive, or maybe it's just a metaphorical hard drive, if I just have the content uh, without any applications uh, or any anything external, you know, maybe I, I can plug that hard drive into. Uh, you know, some sort of Linux box, and just with basic tools, uh, command line tools or something, uh, based on the content that's there, I can make sense of it. Uh, it is self-describing, uh, and it is meaningful in and of itself without the need for, uh, you know, any other information or any other, uh, you know, proprietary or, you know, specific applications to, to make sense of it. So that, that's kind of the idea there. Um, so in, in, in sort of this exploration and uh, the, the evolution of the OCFL initiative, uh, and, and actually quite honestly leading into the initiative in the first place, um, there's this recognition of a gap um, between the, the digital preservation principles uh, that we know and, and strong recommendations for realizing or satisfying those principles. And, and, and that's where OCFL comes in. 
uh, we've we've tried to uh, through the specification provide as noted here a simple non-proprietary specified open standards approach uh, to the layout of preservation persistence so th that's that's what we're trying to do and and part of this is also the recognition that uh, for I think all of us, hopefully, uh, the content that we are trying to steward and preserve and, and make accessible uh, outlives the applications that interact with that content. So, you know, if it's a digital repository system or if it's an access system or something else, it, it, the content is what moves through time. Applications come and go every few years. And so, uh, it's extremely important that we have a stable, specified layout of our, our preservation persistence so that applications ideally can be tooled to work with content in the stable format, the stable layout, um, if, without requiring migrations every single time we choose a new application. We, we don't want our content in, in sort of uh, you know, how our content is, you know, it is found on disk and how it's preserved to be dictated by, uh, you know, the, the latest application. So looking for stability at the persistence layer, uh, enabling uh, flexibility um, at the application layer. So all of this um, has been driven by uh, a handful of kind of top level requirements that you see here. And, and I'll, I'll talk about each of them um, in depth uh, here next, but just for the sake of repetition. Um, uh, the, the driving requirements are around completeness, parsability, robustness, versioning, and storage diversity. So taking it from the top, um, and and you know, be, be thinking about other things that you know, you're interested in getting out of this you know, this time that we have here together, or any questions. Like you, even though you know, like once I get going, um, you know, I can ramble on. So please stop me. Um, but uh, for uh, the thank you, oh, was there something actually? Oh um, no, I just will do. But um, I, I actually um, maybe right before we get into each of these requirements, I, I was yeah. curious, like. Um, I'm sorry not to like mention it earlier, yeah. but when it came to the community call, like the original community call, and then maybe like over time, um, I, I was just interested in whether or not, um, you know, that topic of interoperability really kind of like rang true with people in terms of, okay, well, you know, um, there's an, an enormous support for, for bag at bags, there's enormous support for, the, you know, there's the need for versioning. Um, there's di these different core things that OCFL can, you know, kind of address or work with. Um, like how, how, like, I guess, how prominent was that interoperability like topic during some of these discussions or was it, was that sort of like something that came up a little later or? Um, and, and, and so maybe just to put a finer point on it, Eric, uh, so uh, the, the aspect of interoperability that, uh, that you're talking about is you, maybe like applications, different applications being on, being able to interoperate with the persistence. Oh, um, no, I guess yeah. I, I should I should clarify. Yeah, um, what I was thinking is uh, you know working across institutions that have their own um, digital preservation repositories. Like if a repository at an institution supports OCFL or supports a particular type of, you know, package or, or bag or something like that. Um, you know, it, it, in terms of building a distributed digital preservation like network, mm. um, you know, how, I guess, how much discussion was there about uh, that sort of, um, that sort of requirement or that sort of like uh, desire to be able to interoperate across institutions? Um, just by supporting something like OCFL. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I can't say that it was a, a driving sentiment. I mean, it, certainly it has come up um, and it, it continues to come up in, especially in the context of Deepin, right? Uh, right. Yeah, it's, you know, so I, th I think that's a big part of uh, what you know, several of these systems, including Deepin has been trying to 
uh, enable. Um, but uh, yeah, sort of a distributed digital preservation system. Uh, yeah, it, that that hasn't been quite honestly a, a driving requirement uh, in in the OCFL conversations. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I was curious. Um, you know, while while we're here, are there, are there other uh, other things that maybe would be useful just to raise before I carry on? Think about it. All right. Um, so in, in terms of uh, completeness, what we're talking about here is uh, kind of like you would assume uh, that everything that you need, uh, you, the object itself the, that you're preserving is what you find within the OCFL is in and of itself complete. Uh, so there's, there is an expectation that there's not uh, a need for like this other database or this other system or these other files somewhere else to uh, make sense of or to complete uh, the, the content that you are preserving. So everything that you need is within the OCFL object uh, and which you know, that enables the notion of rebuildability um, among other things. So that yeah, you know, I, I can rebuild. Basically, I can completely take away my application. And I can rebuild it from what's on disk, or I can rebuild it from what's in the OCFL, um, or I can rebuild my discovery layer. Or I can rebuild my indices, that sort of thing. So, uh, this the strong notion of completeness, um, and then also uh, parsability. And, and for me, there's sort of two main aspects of parsability here. Uh, one is, and kind of like what I alluded to at the beginning, um, this notion of transparency in that um, yeah, I, I can see what's on disk or I can see what's in my S3 bucket and it makes sense. Uh, as a human, I can look at it uh, and you know, just looking through some JSON, uh, yeah, I can see how the files are organized and and it provides a clear picture. So uh, parsability by humans, and then also uh, due to the nature, nature of this being specified, uh, it's also parsable by applications. You can write software against uh, the structures that are within OCFL. Um, thirdly is robustness. And, and the main element here is that uh, digest checksums are integral to OCFL um, in terms of tracking files, as well as ensuring that um, they haven't you know, changed without uh, or, you know, sort of unexpectedly changed. Um, there, there's also a, a, a strong notion of versioning. And you know, in some ways, if, if I'm just sort of being loose, um, yeah, I, I'll describe OCFL as being bagged with versioning. Um, you know, there's a certain amount of truth to that. But uh, OCFL, uh, um, it uh, does versioning at the file level. So, uh, you know, between versions of an OCFL object, um, you, if, if a file is added or if a file is updated or removed, uh, OCFL tracks this. It, it does not track, you know, sort of deltas within a file. Um, it just like if a file has changed or not is, is the sort of level of versioning that OCFL does. And it does it through um, a forward delta um, mechanism, which basically uh, allows for a couple of, I think, very nice uh, features. You know, one is once a version has been created uh, within an OCFL object, it's immutable. So uh, you know, a, a version is, is sort of set and doesn't get changed after that. Um, uh, and and then also in terms of uh, storage space, uh, the forward deltaing it uh, allows for deduplication. So um, if in version five you have these six files, you don't have to actually have all six files in the version five or six directory. Uh, you can just reference that file in, in previous versions. So uh, versioning, and then finally uh, the requirement around storage diversity, and and basically. Uh, OCFL uh, obviously supports uh, writing the structures out to file systems, but also has been designed to support object stores, uh, for example, S3. So there was, um, there was a quick question that came up uh, from Nathan in the chat about um, 
protecting against malicious actors changing a file and updating the checksum in the inventory uh, to avoid detection. Is that, um, is that something, so, so I was actually looking at this back and, I'm, and I'll, I'll kind of add to that question with regard to uh, now that the digests themselves can be in the inventory file, um, but then there's, there's not, it, I, I don't remember seeing like a requirement for a specific type of digest, like a support for, for a, a bunch of different ones is there. Um, but there's also the idea of adding additional fixity information inside of an OCFL object, is that right? That is right, yeah. Uh, do you wanna, can you um, elaborate a little bit about how that, that works out? Uh, or should we wait? Well, uh, uh, there's no, no need to wait. Um, we will we will we will revisit this um, at a high level here in a moment. But uh, so maybe just a, a couple of points, and, and let me just read Nathan your comment here just uh, um, quickly. Uh, so. Um, So, I, I mean, and to a certain degree, Nathan, I, you, you're following up maybe on your own question with the recognition that uh, there's a sidecar file associated with the inventory file that contains the checksum of the inventory file. Um, so, you know, that, that, that provides guarantees that what is inside the inventory file is what you think should be there. I mean, it, it hasn't been either tampered with or, uh, you know, inadvertently uh, copied over with a, you know like a, a bad version of the inventory file that you know that's the intention there which you're uh, clearly aware of and then then eric like you're saying uh there is an optional block within the inventory file to uh capture uh not only the the primary digest or checksum associated with each file which is used internally within ocfl but also to provide um other uh checksums that you know, that you might, uh, you, know, you know, that would potentially be used for additional assurances. You know, like if, if all four of these checksums match the file, there's you know, pretty low probability that the file is not what you think it should be. Um, but in terms of, you know, further malicious activity, uh, yeah, I, I could, you know, there's no, there's nothing in there, uh, you know, around, you know, obviously, like if someone's in there mucking with things, they can do whatever they want to, obviously. Um, um, but there, you, uh, each version within an OCFL object also optionally has the inventory file for that version as well as the sidecar file. So, um, so that, you know, that's just kind of another layer that you know, provides assurances that yes, everything at this version level is what you would expect it to be. Um, you know, so you, you, if you wanted to muck with something, you would have to do it in several places, you know, like many places. Um, you know, but you know, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a separate conversation around access to the systems in general. Uh, and, and actually, Nathan, if you just want to come off mute, it might even be even um, you know, like a higher bandwidth conversation. I think I think you've addressed all the um, you know salient points that that you know to some degree you can't protect against every act of malfeasance and what's possible if someone actually gets in you know you have a multi-strategy approach from for general information security and system security um, but as far as OCFL itself being able to detect intrusions um, you know it seems it's pretty robust in 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 the way it's set up to. Um, although not perhaps infallible, give you pretty good safeguards um, with some verification of when you're interacting that nothing has changed um, through through human intervention. This is great. Thank you. Yeah, it, yeah, no, and, and thanks for raising it, Nathan. I, yeah, I, I, I think definitely in terms of inadvertent corruption, OCFL will flag that, or you know, sort of it has everything in place to flag that if if. Yeah, if um, a bad actor is getting into the system, yeah, they're, yeah, they, you know, just like, yeah, with, it, with I think, many systems, yeah, they're, they're, they could probably, they could probably, uh, yeah, change things. Um, and Jim, uh, 
I didn't know if you wanted to jump in here as well. All right. Okay. Um, so I, I, I did. Uh, so it's good timing. I did want to change gears a little bit here um, and uh, dive into uh, the anatomy of an OCFL, sort of OCFL in general. And um, you know, that I feel like there are three main uh, organizational structures uh, to OCFL, which we'll talk about here. Uh, and, and sort of taking it from the top all the way down. So at, at the very top is the notion of the NoCFL storage route. And so you can think of this as a top level directory or maybe a, a bucket in Amazon. Uh, you know, so this is the, you know, the location under which all of your OCFL content exists. Um, and looking at the slide here, um, you know, let me just sort of talk through the elements. So the first, the zero equals OCFL, file that's a that's a namaste file and, and this is uh, along the lines of uh, using uh, existing standards or existing practices in the community uh, sort of coming out of some of the uh, earlier cdl work basically this just flags uh, this directory as the storage route uh, so this is a certain version of ocfl uh, that's what that namaste file does uh, then optionally uh, we can have, uh, and it's recommended to do so, a textual-based uh, uh, representation of the OCFL specification itself. Uh, we have that at the root of uh, your OCFL repository. Uh, then next one here, the OCFL layout. Uh, that is a mechanism for uh, describing the mapping, and, and this is all spec'd out, so uh, machines can make sense of this as well, but describing the mapping between individual object IDs and where you can find those objects uh, within the storage route. Um, so you know, it, it would describe the nature of the pear tree uh, setup that you're using, or you know, if you're using some variant of pear tree, um, or if you see here in this example, uh, something that's more flat, you know, maybe it's a more of a one-to-one you know, -one mapping between the the object ID and the directory in which that object uh, resides. Yeah. So, but in any case, the OCFL layout.json file uh, it provides indication of the mapping between IDs and uh, where those objects are found. Um, and then the next level down are individual objects, and and so here we see two examples of object roots, um, and in diving in uh, uh, only slightly more deeply. Um, so uh, the object root and, and that that the name of that directory would be, um, you know, what, what, whatever makes sense. Uh, you know, it, maybe it's the full ID of your object. Maybe it's just like the last two elements in your pear tree, or you know, whatever you you specified. But there's a directory inside of it is another Namaste file that uh, indicates that this is an OCFL object of a certain version. Uh, and then the inventory file that we have been talking about a little bit here uh, is is at the the root of the object, as well as the sidecar file that basically just contains the digest um, of that inventory file, uh, and and then you you'll have a series of uh, version directories. Uh, you know, this is a pretty simple example. There's only one, uh, but presumably there'd be a v v1, v2, v3, uh, however many, um, and then optionally inside of each of those inventory directory, excuse me, the version directories, uh, you can have, uh, and it's recommended to do so. Um, an inventory file that's basically uh, for the most current version uh, of the object, it will be an exact copy. So the inventory file that's found in the most recent version, which in this case, you know, there's only one. Yeah, so these two inventory.json files are identical. Um, if I had a version two, uh, the top level inventory file would be the same as the one that's in version two. And the one that's in version one would just be capturing the state of the, the item at version one. Etc. Um, and then the sidecar file, and then there's a, a, a directory within each version uh, directory uh, by default. It's called content, but uh, you can uh, there's a specified way of indicating that uh, the name will be something different, like data or or whatever you know whatever makes sense for you. And, and that's where the actual you know, content resides. Um, that's the OCFL object. And then the the last of the three organizational structures is uh, the inventory uh, uh, .json file, 
and maybe without going into full detail here, I'll, I'll just note uh, that there is basically um, files are tracked uh, via their digest and you can specify what there's a default digest here of 512, but you, you can use other digests there. Um, an indication of what is the, the current version uh, so that uh, it's easier for software instead of iterating over all the versions and figuring out which one is you know, the biggest number. Uh, there's just a, a property there saying this is the head version. Go straight there. Uh, the ID of the object. Um, and then this manifest block, basically it contains all of the files for all of the versions. Uh, so every file that's represented in any version of this OCFL object will be found in the manifest block. And then diving all the way down into the version block, you'll see that there's a state a state block. And so the, the di basically you can reference files in the manifest block you know, based on their digest. Um, and and you know, I think it's quite reasonable to expect that for different versions, you know, the state will be different. So there will, the state block will contain uh, different you know, references to different files um, you know, based on what's happening in that version. Um, and then I'll just sort of uh, highlight that you'll notice that it, between the manifest block and the state block, uh, there is there they both have paths associated with them, and and the man the path in the manifest block which you see is v1 slash content slash file dot txt uh, that is uh, what we call the content path you know you kind of think of it as like a, the physical path like like this is where the file actually exists in your OCFL object, whereas in the state block this is more like the logical the logical path so that when uh, maybe I am representing or exposing this OCFL object to the user or, uh, you know, like sort of outside of OCFL, you know, this is the path at which uh, you should be uh, rendering this particular file. So there's a different, you know, it, and they can be the same. I mean, you could, you could have your, your content paths and, and the logical paths be the same, but there, there's a mechanism here for you can store your files within OCFL in a different way than you want them to actually be represented. Um, so th those are three important structures within OCFL. Um, let me just briefly pause. Hey, Andrew, it's Nathan Tolman again. Um, hey, Nathan. So <laughs> another question, although it's not directly related to this, I just thought of it while you were speaking about this. It references something you said earlier. But you said each version of an object is immutable. Um, can objects themselves be deleted, which is a real need, right? There's human error, PII, PHI, or your dean yep. says, go do this, you know, just, uh, is that possible in here? So there is a strong uh, recommendation you know, that, you know, like that OCFL, you know, OCFL does not uh, specify how to delete objects because, you know, that's in some ways, um, antithetical to uh, the, the digital preservation that we're trying to achieve. But uh, there is also the practical awareness that, you know, like you're saying, sometimes you, sometimes you just have to purge something from the repository. Um, and uh, uh, if you, if, I was going to say, and I will say, um, that uh, alongside of the OCFL specification is um, another document called implementation notes. And you know, if you go to any of you know, go to OCFL.io and you know, drill around, basically if you if you find the specification uh, at the top there, there's a link to the implementation notes where it describes this scenario for, okay, I need to purge something. And it you know, it talks, there's some discussion there of how this might be achieved. Um, but at a high level, it's it, like we didn't want to specify anything around that, but um, I think the short answer, well, the medium size answer at this point is um, that uh, you would just delete the object and then either recreate a new object uh, containing elements that you know, you didn't have to uh, redact you know, in the new object. And that new object, you know, I think we all know that you you know, shouldn't repurpose URIs or identifiers you know for something that's not what it used to be. But you know, in some you might have to do that in this case, or maybe you'd have a placeholder object within OCFL that just references points to in some way or another. Like, okay, I created this new object over here that represents this thing that I had to purge. 
um, you know, you can look over there. So I guess it's all to say that there is some discussion about it. OCFL doesn't specify how that's handled. Um, because OCFL doesn't specify how it should be handled and it's left as an implementation note, um, does that mean different OCFL clients might handle this differently? And in some ways, it might be a very manual process. And I, I just raise this because this has been a problem for me in some other preservation environments, the, the ability or lack of ability to delete, um, you know, because there are times like, hey, social security numbers are in there, right? You know, you just, you have to get them out. You can't just retire. You can't just um, say, we're not gonna use this anymore, but you actually have to remove the things from disk. True, and, and so what are you, are you saying, Nathan, just like, yeah, given the fact that's not specified, does it does that represent a point of divergence and incompatibility or? Yeah, yeah, essentially, I guess that's what I'm getting at. You know, if we have a variety of applications that start to use OCFL as sort of the foundation, will we start to see, you know, this this might be a divergence between those applications and how they handle object deletion? Yeah, and, and, and so I, you, you raise a, um, Another point that I uh, you know, don't have built into this time to talk about, but I'll, but since you raise it, I think it's an interesting thing to mention, which there is this notion of extensions. Um, and, and so uh, alongside of the OCFL specification is the recognition that, and I think you, you raise a, um, a good use case for this, and one that I don't think has been raised before. Uh, you're a pioneer, Nathan. Um, the around you know so how do we extend ocfl in ways that are not a part of the specification um and and for example there are extensions around the layout you know sort of the ocfl layout the mapping between ids and and where you know what um directories they live in uh there's a, a, another completely different um extension around what's called mutable head so ocfl is what things should look like on disk it doesn't talk anything about um you know how do i how do I create or modify objects? Um, you know, sort of, uh, and then snapshot a version. You know, sort of like there's the, the active object, and then there's the stable object, and and so uh, there's an extension around. You know, how as a interoperable client uh, should you be? You know, uh, adding, changing, updating files within an object. You know, while it's in flight, and then snapshot it into an OCFL version. Um, you know, and, and so I think what you're talking about here, Nathan, would fit uh, very well into this notion of OCFL extensions. So um, I, th I think that there's room to specify this so that there is the possibility for interoperability. Um, and and t until now, uh, and, and I, I, you know, I hope that you take this opportunity for uh, everyone's benefit to uh, you know, sort of think about how it could be specified and then we could build it into an extension. Great. Thank you to know that that unanticipated needs were envisioned and a way to handle them. That's that's always great. great to see too. Sorry to to waylay. Yeah, no, no, that's great. Um in, in, any others? Or there there are more people on the line than there are voices that we're hearing. I'm gonna continue on. Think about it. Um so uh, yeah, as I mentioned here, uh, the editorial team uh, come from a, a few different institutions here, um, just for your information. And uh, so yeah, and this kind of circles back to the, the objective that I raised at the beginning, um, uh, you know, around. So how, how do we take this opportunity? I, I feel like the the focus and objective of OCFL and a lot of what um, and the SA is trying to achieve are so well aligned. Uh, you know, in, in addition to you know, presumably Eric and team here, you you bring people uh, into this call to for information sharing. Um, you know, but I guess I just wonder, you know, is can we do more? Uh, you know, is, is there a, a collaboration opportunity? Is there a, you know just sort of a, a community wide opportunity that, that could be realized with um, you know, sort of the affinity that we share? There's <clears throat> I was wondering if I could bounce a couple ideas off of you awesome. related to this. So I've I've wondered about how well OCFL would work as kind of a, a way of verifying content in um, our system. So serialize stuff into an OCFL format and then sort of read it back and check that the integrity 
matches. And in particular then to say like, when our system uh, version something three times, if we also were to version something in OCFL three times, or applying the same kinds of versioning actions, do we end up with the same resulting object? Like, could OCFL sort of work as a, because, you know, presumably there'd be multiple implementations and it's a well-documented standard. Could you actually, whether or not you were really persisting all your content in OCFL, could you use it as a way of verifying test cases for a repository system? I'm, I'm, I, and, and yeah, thanks, Terry. I'm trying to understand the question, um, and and I, and I'm just wondering if someone else could maybe rearticulate uh, yeah, Terry's question. So, so as I understand it. Um, you know, since actually Terry and I work on the same system, um, you know, the, the notion of having multiple versions and making them consistent across different repositories, is that what you're asking about, Terry, like in terms of across different technologies? So what I'm thinking about is there, there's just complexity in certain versioning scenarios. And so I'm wondering if OCFL has a well-documented mechanism for how it treats various versioning edge cases, could you sort of validate your own versioning logic by applying the same actions in an OCFL repository and sort of verifying results? Hmm. I, I guess the, the way I see OCFL at least is it, it does a very good job of capturing the state of an object you know, at, a, at a certain point in time uh, and, and as that state changes over time. Um, so to the degree that uh, the model you're talking about you know, can fit into that notion, um, yeah. Sorry if I've, I've th <laughs> thrown something confusing your way. It's just kind of been an idea I've been kicking around. Um, I'm thinking about like the early days of XML where all of a sudden there were all these various tools you could use to verify um, independently the integrity of content. I've wondered if OCFL at a much higher level could you know, give you an independent way of verifying the state of a repository object. Yeah, and, and I, yeah, I apologize. I don't, I, I can't really speak to it. Um, you know, and, and the, the only thing that you know, just, and, it, and maybe it's only vaguely, vaguely related, Terry, um, is the fact that there, there is validation as it relates to OCFL. Uh, you know, so, I mean, I, I'm not, I suspect it doesn't exactly align with the use case that you're raising, but, um, and I, I brought up the, the slide here. Uh, and at the very bottom, just sort of dangling is the you know the mention of validator. So you know, since OCFL is specified, it does allow for and actually there's tooling around this. You know, running a validator, um, you know, an existing validator uh, that does actually exist um, on your OCFL repository that uh, you know sort of says everything like everything in terms of structure, in terms of your inventories, um, is what you think it is. But but I, but I feel like you're talking about something slightly different. Yeah, I don't want to hold up other people's questions with this, but. Yeah, by all means, um, if other folks have questions, uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes left. I just want to make sure um, people get a chance to, uh, to ask any questions of Andrew that they'd like to ask. And, and, and so maybe my question, while you're thinking about your questions, uh, is it was sound like you also had some questions, Eric. So I don't want to uh, stomp on that time. But um, uh, you, so in terms of the, this interest group um, and the way this inter group, interest group is organized, uh, you uh, and and calls like this call, 
you know, is the idea that just for the team, it's uh, you know, sort of establishing a shared set of understanding around you know, various things that are happening in the community, or uh, you know, is there um, you know, like a, another objective that uh, is, is trying to be achieved or facilitated by these calls? Yeah, um, right. So, so I think it's both of those. Um, or there's definitely like uh, you know the idea that we're trying to share information and um, you know find out where individuals or institutions have a particular um, you know experience to share, or maybe there's common grounds across institutions or uh, common grounds across you know the folks who are participating in calls. Um, with you know, which I think is the first and foremost, like that's one thing we're getting together with shared interest. Um, the other thing that that's uh, in the background is, um, and I, I had mentioned like uh, the possibility of surveys or other things at the very beginning um, that, you know, the NDSA has uh, the interest groups. They also have work, working groups that are there. And um, sometimes topics that come up in the interest groups will feed what a working group actually does. Um, so for, for example, like there's a storage survey that the NDSA puts out every X number of years. Um, you know, you know, if it only comes out once every couple of years, even, you know, at that point, a lot of has changed. Um, so for example, you know, in, in the next storage survey or in yet a, a different type of survey, the NDSA introduces, you know, uh, a, you know, a direct example would be, you know, how can we introduce questions about OCFL and the potential for usage of OCFL uh, when it comes to, say, for example, use of cloud storage? Um, how did you know? Do those does OCFL play well with cloud storage? And you know, um, what sorts of questions might be included in that sort of example? Um, we could we could come up with some of those questions in the interest group. We could try to feed those to the working group that was going to be responsible for that survey. Um, so that sort of collaboration is, is, you know, definitely something we want to try to encourage as well. That makes sense. Yeah, and that's the most direct example that I, I'm, I'm immediate example that I can come up with um, at the moment. And, and to me, it would make sense that um, in the future, and if folks are, are open to it, um, you know, when that working group spins up about the storage survey or another possible related survey that maybe we could you know, reach back out to the OCFL community or to one of your community calls and say, um, you know, we're interested in trying to get more information and collaborate and just, you know, um, for the for benefit uh, of everyone involved. So um, that'd be something that would be, uh, you know, interesting to try to take on in the future. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I guess along those lines, you know, kind of coming at it from the OCFL side, uh, and, and the community calls that take place and, and uh, trying to be as relevant as possible to current needs and interests. Uh, and, and then I'll also bring in, for example, at Harvard, uh, we, we are designing out how this uh, OCFL will be managed in the context of S3. Um, you know, it was like, it's easy for me to imagine, although, you know, just imagining uh, you know, that there would be a group of, of uh, representatives from different institutions that maybe care about, you know, like you were saying, Eric, like, how do you do OCFL in S3? Or Nathan, like you were saying here in the chat, like, how do you do OCFL on tape? Um, you know, you just sort of uh, you know, having these conversations and, it, and it, you know, I don't think it needs to be you know, completely scheduled out and structured, although you know, maybe that helps with engagement, but um, yeah, I, I, I could see having uh, groups of interest, you know, ha having these ongoing conversations. I think from the OCFL community, we have a hard time always knowing what is most pertinent, relevant, and top of mind uh, to you know try to rally conversation around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe that's something we can help out with. I mean, we you know a couple of months ago when Leah and I were were trying to figure out what this group wanted to talk about each month. Um, you know, we, we put together a poll just like uh, actually Nathan did last year and, um, you know, it's, uh, we could share some of those topics. I mean, I can point you directly to that poll and I, you know, there's probably a, some topics that overlap uh, with the potential use of OCFL and others that don't, but it'd be worth, you know, kind of kicking around and uh, seeing what makes sense. Um, I could definitely do that. that. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. I'd really appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, 
Is there, so because uh, Nathan had mentioned this other question about uh, accomplished, uh, can OC available be accomplished on tape? Um, we only have a few minutes left. I just want to make sure um, before we go for that question, are there any other questions that folks have? Hi, I have a quick question. I'm Shinro Kim from Cornell. Um, hey. What would be a, I mean, it is, I think OCFL is a very generic tool. And sometimes uh, there might come across uh, cases where your specific needs are not met. So what would be the best uh, practice to deal with those kind of cases? I think if you, I mean, even one way you can deal with it, I guess, is uh, using the extension, but wouldn't that break, I mean, not work with other generic uh, API implementations with, uh, from other institutions, which kind of is the purpose, one of the purpose for OCFL? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess it, we probably need to get into details, right, of you know, what what's the scenario that can't be supported. Uh, so it's kind of hard to say in the general case, but but I, yeah, I, I think you put your finger on the the uh, the purpose of the extensions is to accommodate those types of situations, and and the reason that it is a formalized mechanism, this extensions mechanism, is that it be specified so that it does allow for interoperability of of implementation, um, you know, as opposed to. Uh, you're just doing something locally and not you know, not sharing it, not you know, not uh, you know, providing a way for others to to use that same approach. But but I yeah I, I think a, a concrete example would uh, would also be helpful if you had something in mind. You know, like of a scenario that OCL could not handle, which I'm sure there are you know, plenty. Uh, we are still exploring the options, and one of the things we came across was uh, dealing with the uh, timestamp for each files. And it, and, and so the timestamp that's re represented potentially on the file system, or the timestamp that uh, is captured in the inventory. In the inventory for each for each files for whenever a file is added or, or new version comes up or something so that we always know the latest, most recent file stamp for, uh, for the latest version. Hmm. Yeah, it, 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 we might not have time to go into full detail there, but yeah, I kind of get this sense. Are, are you suggesting that maybe files are being changed within an OCFL? Mm, no. Mm, I, I think it's, I think I, I think it's, I, I, I think I got the answer. Okay. Um, and then Nathan, just quickly um, on, on your question, I, I, I'll, I'll just say that, and this, this speaks to the immutability and the forward delta uh, concepts of OCFL. So, uh, I mean, there's definitely, you know, it depends on, you know, the nature of the tape system that you're using, but uh, OCFL uh, in no way requires that any information that has been written to OCFL needs to be updated in the future. So um, it could, uh, OCFL could, you know, be well suited for a tape system in that sense, like where we're not changing anything that was previously written into the OCFL. The best backup ever. So we're, we're okay. kind of at the hour. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and, and wrap up. Um, I would, you know, definitely encourage folks to add any questions they might have to the to the running notes. Um, normally, if Lee and I were both here, one of us would probably be taking uh, better notes. Uh, so I'll try to add a little bit to uh, what came up uh, to the running notes doc. Um, so maybe we could always get those, try to get those addressed later. Um, but um, I, yeah, Andrew, I just wanted to thank you very much for your presentation and uh, and the conversation. Yeah, well, I appreciate being here, and, and thanks for reaching out. And um, yeah, if, if yeah, if we if we can continue the conversation in one form or another, uh, I would really appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely definitely follow up, and then um, if. 
uh, you know, if any of our subsequent meetings for the group, if OCFL or when OCFL comes back up, um, you know, we'll make sure to kind of like uh, go full circle, I'm sorry, full circle and, and uh, get back to you. Um, so yeah, well, thank you very much. And um, then uh, just a quick reminder that we will post the um, recording of this session on the YouTube channel, probably in about a week and a half. So if folks want to get back to it, uh, it will be there. And um, we look forward to seeing everybody next month. Thank you. Thanks again. so much. Bye All right. Thanks, bye, -bye everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Robin. Thanks.